Merry Antichristmas and welcome to Godless Reads, the chilling tales for Dark Knight show where different godless authors read their own story. I'm Drew Stepick, owner of Godless.com and the Godless app. I'm coming to you from two different locations to celebrate Christmas and the holiday season. The first of these is Nakatomi Plaza from the movie Die Hard, which is a Christmas movie. A lot of people don't know that it's actually the Fox Lot corporate offices. The second of these is the gymnasium from the dance scene in It's a Wonderful Life. This is also the Beverly Hills High School gym. Gym. This week's story is called Last Christmas and it's by author Kevin Sweeney. I'm switching things up this week because I wanted to address something that's really important to me and the godless community and it should be to the horror community in general. Kevin recently got really bad news for the holidays. The first of which is that his wife doesn't have a long time to live uh, unless she gets a heart transplant. If that weren't bad enough, Kev also found out that uh, he's sick as well. If Kev responds well to chemotherapy, he's got a 50-50 chance of survival. So it's not lost on me that I'm shooting this from the Die Hard building, the gym from It's a Wonderful Life, and Kev's story is called Last Christmas. I had a very, very, very hard time editing this video because it was a very profound experience for me. Kevin has become a very good friend and someone that I love from the bottom of my heart. That said, by choosing these locations, I'm not doing it to be catty or flippant. He's important to me, and I reached out to him to ask him which of these two locations I should do. Since there are stones throw away from each other, I did both. I did these locations because I think it's important around the holidays to reach out to everyone you love and tell them that you love them. It's also important during the holidays to reach out to people you have a beef with and tell them that you love them as well. Be well, Mr. Sweeney. I know everyone is sending their prayers and their well wishes from the horror community. We love you to death, man. With a very heavy heart, I bring you Last Christmas by Kevin Sweeney. Last Christmas by Kevin Sweeney. The newsreader announced the end of the world in a surprisingly chipper tone of voice. This was not her fault. The fault lay with the editor, who had assumed that the item about the Christmas star was a puff piece, the kind of item that came at the end of the news to end on a happy note after the usual grim list of disasters, atrocities and gloom which made up a typical broadcast. So the newsreader's tone of voice was light and cheerful as she explained that universal extinction was scheduled in less than a fortnight. And finally, researchers analyzing data from the Grinch Krampus Deep Space Telescope array have made a surprising discovery about the star that heralded the birth of Jesus Christ. As we all know, 2,000 years ago a star was said to have appeared in the sky above Bethlehem on the day that the Messiah was born. It was this star, in fact, that was used by the three wise men to navigate. The researchers have identified that this star was, in fact, a supernova, which is an explosion that happens when certain supermassive stars explode at the end of their lives. Fascinating stuff, Ellen, said the newsreader's co-host. Indeed, Tom. Furthermore, the Grinch Krampus' scientists have estimated that the massive amounts of deadly gamma particles that were released by the supernova 2,000 years ago have been traveling through space all this time, and a wave of hard radiation is due to pass through our very own solar system in 12 days' time. The newsreader's voice suddenly lost its chipper tone and the color drained out of her face. But she was a professional and managed to get the last few words of the story out. Which will strip our planet of its atmosphere and kill all life on Earth, including the human race. Knowing that the world was coming to an end in less than a fortnight made people reassess their plans for the holiday season, though they didn't abandon their traditions altogether. Sujinama, Japan. Junji Saitama reached for the bucket of KFC but then noticed that his hands were covered with blood, and so instead he picked up one of the small packets of pre-moistened napkins provided with the meal to clean his fingers first. It was a topsy-turvy way of doing things, he observed. The cleansing napkins were supposed to be used after eating the greasy portions of chicken, not before. But then it had been a topsy-turvy sort of day. Whilst he carefully wiped his hands clean of blood, he used the time to fully appreciate his own efforts. Mr. Takada, the sales manager, had assigned Saitama the task of organizing the office Christmas party. Mr. Takada assigned all hard, worthless, or bizarre tasks to Saitama. Saitama, as a low-ranking salaryman at the high pseudochromatography column manufacturing plant, had somehow attracted Mr. Takada's ire from the very first day of work. He had no idea why. 
This year, Mr. Takada had wanted the company to celebrate Christmas the traditional Western way and had tasked Saitama with arranging a suitable party at the office. A Western Christmas office party, but Japanese, a fusion of traditions. Mr. Takada had spent a month visiting a manufacturing concern in the United Kingdom that year and had grown enamored with much of European culture. During his time there, he had learned much about the regional sales of chromatography columns, as well as the local office culture, including the Christmas time celebration, when co-workers would set aside in the evening where they would all drink and eat together, and all social boundaries were temporarily forgotten. Saitama had meekly accepted the responsibility, heaped atop all the other responsibilities which were not technically part of his job. The problem was, he had very little understanding of the Christmas holiday that Americans and Europeans made such a big deal about. So he had set to research, and grown confused. Christmas, at its heart, revolved around two figures. The Jesus of the Christian religion, and the red-robed figure of Santa Claus. These two fictional men seemed to have nothing in common. Saitama was perplexed. How could this Western holiday revolve both around an ascetic saint and an obese gift-giver? Christmas was celebrated in Japan, of course, but in a much different way. It wasn't a proper holiday as such, but any excuse for a celebration was eagerly seized upon. The only truly Japanese tradition was to buy and eat KFC. People ordered their Christmas dinner buckets days in advance. According to Saitama's research, the traditional Western dish of the day was a roast turkey or goose. So maybe things weren't so different. Saitama had also researched the Western notion of the office Christmas party. One thing he learned from translated blog posts was that very often at these events, thanks to alcohol, liaisons were often struck up between co-workers. Which explained Mr. Takada's interest, the dirty old man. Saitama had begun to stress over organising a suitably Western-style office celebration of a puzzling mismatch of notions. Christmas was supposedly the anniversary of the birth of Jesus, and yet a bearded man travelled the world in a single night and gave presents to other boys and girls. People were supposed to reflect on the holiness of the occasion, yet indulged in rampant materialism. All got drunk and forgot social protocol in the workplace with their colleagues. Mr. Takada asked for continual updates. Saitama assured him that all was going well with the planning. Me, it was not. And then the news about Doomsday broke. Like people all over the world, Saitama took time to absorb the information. He reflected on how odd it was that the impending disaster was so closely linked to the advent of the event which had been stressing him for over a month. Then, feeling the reality of his and everyone else's mortality upon him, he had gone quietly and purposefully insane. He had gone to see his boss at home. It was Mr. Takada's wife who had answered the door. Looking at Mrs. Takada, Saitama understood why his boss would like the opportunity to break the usually strict social boundaries between himself and the other employees of Hisuda Chromatography. Or at least the female ones applied with alcohol. Or Christmas cheer. Saitama introduced himself, apologized deeply for the intrusion, and then shot her in the face with the nail gun he was carrying. The nails burst her eyes and blasted her teeth out of her mouth. Mr. Takada had foolishly come to find out what the screaming was about and found his put-upon employee waiting for him. Saitama's boss took a high-pressure nail in the belly and two in the right knee, splitting his kneecap before he agreed to do what Saitama asked of him. The request was to put on a costume. Mr. Takada's wife had screamed for help and clawed at what used to be her eyes whilst her husband had painfully removed his clothes and donned the gay apparel his underling had brought. Then, when Mr. Takada was dressed in the red suit with white trimmings and was wearing the great big false beard of snowy curls, Saitama had nailed his hands to the wall, then his testicles. Mr. Takada had screamed and ranted and thrashed his head around, which caused the floppy hat on his head to keep falling off. So Saitama had used the gun to nail it to his skull. His decorating done, he found a nearby KFC on his phone that was open despite so many people no longer showing up for work since Doomsday was announced. And he ordered in. With Santa Claus crucified, Junji Saitama happily munched fried chicken and congratulated himself on a perfect fusion of East and West Christmas traditions. Tarragona, Spain. For the past year, it seemed that Zoraida Dali's entire world had revolved around shit. 
She worked as a cleaner in an office building. Every floor had four different bathrooms shared by the various businesses that worked in the building. From six until midnight, she cleaned toilets. Then, when she arrived home, she had cloth nappies to attend to. Zoraida did not have a child, but elderly and incontinent parents. The nappies were theirs. Her brothers and sister had agreed that Papa and Mama needed full-time care, and that Zoraida, being the youngest and unmarried, should move back to the family home to take care of them. This agreement had been made at the big Christmas feast almost exactly one year ago. At the big kitchen table, groaning under a huge pot of Escudella y Candola, Zoraida had been blindsided. Evidently, her siblings had decided the issue beforehand and kept quiet so that she had no chance to argue for an alternative. So she had moved home, leaving nursing college. Her family assured her it was just as well. She had only decided to become a nurse when it was clear she was not smart enough to be a doctor. And if she wanted so badly to be a nurse, what excellent practice to care for their parents. To feed them, to clean them, to organize their medication. So this was her life now. She cleaned up the shit of complete strangers for a living and cleaned up the shit of her own parents whilst at home. Her parents were on different sets of medication for age-related ailments which gave them different bowel movements. Mamas were thin and orange, more liquid than solid, whilst papas were almost black, hard and scaly. At the office building each evening, it was potluck what nightmares might have been left behind in the 40-odd toilets she was expected to scrub. Crusts around the rim, carefully coiled turds in the water, or shy little turtle heads peeking out from around the U-bend. Shit all day, shit all evening. Sarida was exhausted mentally and physically. She was only able to get through the days and weeks and months of shit and more shit by telling herself that her parents would not be around forever and that her cleaning job was only temporary as she worked towards an online diploma in pharmacy dispensing. Then Christmas time had come looming and Zoraida learned that she would also be responsible for having the family around for the big day. After all, it was the family home. It was tradition. Her siblings had pointed out that Mama and Papa did not have many more Christmases ahead of them. How could she be so selfish as to deny them the big family get-together they had known all their lives? Zoraida had relented and just yesterday had retrieved the decorations from the attic. Chief among these, of course, was the nativity figurines. And dear old Tio. Zoraida had almost finished setting up the nativity when the news on the radio had confirmed the findings of the Grinch Krampus telescope team. That this was the very last Christmas. She had been putting out the figurines that were older than her, part of a set which had been handed down from her great-great-grandparents. The wise men, Mary, Joseph, the saviour and the attendant animals, when she had stopped to listen to the report. When the news had finished, she had switched off the radio. The world was going to end. A thought floated freely in her mind, like a stubborn turd circling in an overflowing toilet bowl. My parents did not need to kill my dreams, for they were dead anyway. I simply did not know it. No one did. She had looked at the figurine in her hand. She was holding the Caganer. Sir Ryder had blinked at it, stunned. In the Catalan region of Spain, nativity scenes have a strange additional character known as the Caganer. This figure was of a boy wearing a barretina, the traditional slouch cap of Catalonia, with his trousers pulled down, defecating. The meaning of such a profane idol added to the holy diorama depicting the birth of Jesus was obscure, but Zoraida's father had once explained it to her. God became human, he had said one Christmas long ago, when the future was still hopeful and the young girl had dreams of becoming a doctor. Around her neck was a toy stethoscope, a present she had asked for. That is the single most important fact of the incarnation. Man is part spirit and part animal. God the spirit become animal. And what is more animal, more distant from divinity, than the act of shitting? Sir Ryder was a fiercely bright child, and had asked if that was why Tio appeared by the fireplace every Christmas as well. Her father allowed that it could be so. Sir Ryder, in the grip of memory as she processed the news that the human race was doomed, had glanced towards the fireplace. Tio de Nadal was there, as he was every year. The thing was a wooden log with a smiling face painted on one end, 
half draped with a cloth. During the Christmas period, each night, her brothers and her sister and Zoraida herself have been tasked with feeding Tio a nut or a piece of candy. And every dawn, Tio would have grown a little more. Then, on Christmas morning, when Tio would be the size of the biggest log on the fire, having been fed by the children each evening, then they would attack him. Another Catalan tradition, every household had a Tio de Nadal. The trick was simple. There were a set of Tios ranging from tiny to full size, and each night parents would place the previous log with a slightly larger one, so that it appeared that he was growing. Then on Christmas morning, everyone would be given a stick to beat Tio with, while singing, shit, log, shit, almonds and nuggets. Do not shit herrings, they are too salty. Shit nuggets, which are better. Shit, log, shit, almonds and nougars. And if you don't want to shit, I will give you a smack. And then the cloth that half covered him would be pulled away to reveal a pile of candies and nuts, which he had defecated for the children. Sarida felt the ghost of a smile on her face as she gazed at the shitting log remembering beating him with her siblings as a child. And then she frowned, looking at the Caganer she still had. Shit. Everything was shit. Sarida Dali felt a great calm wash over her. She had finished setting out the decorations, attended to her parents' needs of dinner and nappy changing, and had headed out to her cleaning job. She was one of only two staff who turned out that evening. Zoraida supposed it was because people were upset that the dirty, dreary world was soon coming to a close. It made what she had planned to do a lot easier. And she left long before midnight. When she arrived home, her father was still awake. Mama was snoring gently in the bed next to him. He greeted her with a confused smile. Shouldn't she still be at work? Sarida had set the cooler on his lap. It was a small kind you would take on picnics. It had curious stains around the lid. Papa, Sarida had said, standing over the bed with her hands behind her back. It would seem that this is to be our last Christmas together. You and Mama have such trouble getting about these days, so I thought I would bring one of our traditions to you. What is this child? her father had asked. His eyes were milky with cataracts, but his nose was as keen as ever. Such a stink! Zoraida's hands came out from behind her back. In one, she held a stethoscope. In the other, a spoon. She pressed the spoon into one of her father's hands and then flipped the lid of the cooler open. Tio was floating on the top of the semi-solid contents. I have brought some work home with me, said Zoraida. Eat up, Papa. She lashed her father's bare chest with the stethoscope, whipping him with the metal earpieces so fiercely that they drew blood. He cried out, and as if she were carrying the tune, Zoraida began to sing about almonds and nuggets, whipping her father over and over and over again until he finally began to feed. Eagle Stadir, Iceland. Gunnar Hreinsen had done a lot of reading since his father shot the television and started drinking himself unconscious each day. Gunnar was a good reader, but over the past few days he had encountered words which were entirely new to him, like Ragnarok, Gotadamaran, Apocalypse, and Armageddon. As far as the seven-year-old understood it, they all meant the same thing, but he wasn't sure what it was. He tried asking his father. Pabby would know. But Pabby was acting strangely. Gunnar's father, Hrein, had been drinking Brennevin steadily since the announcement of the end of the world. Whilst he had managed to make meals for Gunnar, he had not been going to work at the aluminium smelting plant or taking his son to school, only leaving their sky-blue corrugated iron home to go to the local Vinbjorn to stock up on alcohol. But in his way, he had been trying to be a good father. As he had sat at the kitchen table drinking Black Death until he blacked out each day, he had been trying to decide how to end his and his son's lives. The gun was the obvious choice. But could he do it? Could he shoot his only son, even to spare him from the nightmare that was coming? 
After the announcement, a few of the television channels that had continued to operate had brought in scientific men and women to explain what was to be expected when the hard radiation hit the earth. The air would boil. The oceans would boil. Animals and plants and people would boil. Hrine had been waiting for someone to say it was all a joke. But when nobody did, he went to his gun closet, selected his favourite hunting rifle, and blasted the television. His boy must not hear any talk of boiling. But now Gunnar had come to him, asking him the meaning of some strange foreign words. The boy's face was serious. He looked so much like his mother. Frein asked Gunnar where he had heard such gobbledygook. Gunnar said he had been online. Frein groaned. He had forgotten about the laptop and how technologically literate his child was. They should have shot the computer as well. Gunnar explained. He only really read Icelandic, but very little content on the net was written in it, so he had been trying to run news articles through a translator, but they had stumbled over the big, weird words. His question was in three parts. What was Armageddon? And was it more important than Christmas? And was it why the Yule lads had not come to visit so far this Christmas? Shrine had blinked at his son. The seven-year-old had made his queries all in one long, multi-segmented rush, and Hrine was drinking hard liquor without even a spoonful of skier in his belly to soak it up. Yes, it was Christmas, wasn't it? And Armageddon. It was... the star that announced the birth of Jesus. Cosmic radiation. Megadeth. If only Erla were here to help explain. The Yule lads had not been to visit. Gunnar was only worried about this Armageddon because it was interfering with Christmas. It meant the Yule lads had not been to visit. Hrine smiled to himself. The Yule lads, the 13 children of the giantess Grilla, who came to town for the 13 nights leading up to Christmas Day to play pranks and make mischief and leave gifts in the shoes of good boys and girls. Could he name them all? Yes, even as drunk as he was, Ryan could name all 13 of the monstrous but merry Yule lads. Sheepcot Clod, Gully Gork, Stubby, Spoon Licker, Pot Scraper, Pole Licker, Door Slammer, Skier Gobbler, Sausage Swiper, Window Peeper, Doorway Sniffer, Meat Hook, and Candle Stealer. He recalled his own childhood, putting his shoes on the windowsill each evening in the hope that whichever Yule lad dropped by the house that night would leave him a small gift rather than a potato, which was what bad girls and boys received. Pabby? Gunnar's voice broke his drunken reverie. Pabby? Will they come? Hmm? The Yule lads. It's been three days and they don't think they've been because I've had nothing in my shoes. Are they coming? Will they be here before Armageddon? Reiner Olofsson had been drinking the caraway flavoured liquor called Brennevin for days. And until his son's innocent, worried question, he'd been heading towards drunken oblivion. He had yet to reach the point where he was able to use the rifle. Boiling. The quiet pleading in Gunnar's voice as he stumbled over that word that simply meant doom sobered him instantly. It was Christmas, a time of light and laughter in the grim, dark and cold of midwinter. A time of wonder and love, yet the Yule lads hadn't even come. What would Erla have thought? An idea entered his head. The kind only men deep inside of alcohol can get. Simple and brilliant and unthinkable outside the logic of hard liquor. Hrine put the bottle down and gripped his son's shoulder. The Yule lads have not come to visit my boy, he said, his eyes focusing and unfocusing as he spoke. Those scoundrels, those curs, those rotten fuckers. Well... If the Yule lads will not come to us, Gunnar, then I say we should go to them. Gunnar looked puzzled and a little scared. What do you mean, Pappy? he asked. Brian pushed himself away from the table and stood unsteadily, placing his hands on his hips. These Yule lads, they live with their mama Grilla and their stepfather Lplo in a cave in the mountains, right? Well, it so happens I know exactly which cave. Gunnar looked astonished. You know where they live? he asked in awe. Of course I do, said Hrine. 
Quickly, Gunnar, put on your coat and your mittens and your boots. I think we should pay a visit on these lads and see what they have to say for themselves. Did they not come to visit my boy these past few nights? Why, I'll knock their heads together. I'll skin their ears. I'll make them eat dung. I'll... I'll bash their butts, cried Gunnar, laughing. Yeah, that's right. We'll bash their butts. Where is their cave, Pabby? Gunnar asked. His father waved a hand. Not far, not far, he said. Now quick, quick, Gunnar. Go and brush yourself warmly. We've heads to knock together and butts to bash. And Gunnar, believing his father, ran off. Brian watched his son dash for the little room where they stored the thick outer garments needed for the Icelandic winters. He would make them a flask each of hot cloudberry juice and wrap some hanginot and laubrofro bread ready to eat, and they would make an adventure of it. Yes, they could have themselves a fine time, a wonderful Christmas to remember for the rest of their lives. And for a moment he lived inside the fantasy. It was just long enough. Prine started to cry. When Gunnar came running back into the kitchen dressed for festive fun, his face was bright and open, grinning, and his father shot him in the head. Carnage, destruction, riots, rape, murder. Forget the partridge and the pear tree. Twelve days in which humanity lost hope, then lost its mind. Every wicked thought squashed by the constraints of the social contract surfaced. Itchy trigger fingers got scratched. Scores were settled. Dark and shameful fantasies hitherto repressed were acted upon. A surprising number of the population came out as cannibals. The blood-dimmed tide was loosed. Cities burned. Civilization died screaming. Then Twelfth Night arrived. For the first time in history, the world was quiet as everyone looked skywards. When it started, it looked like the Aurora Borealis. Only it was the entire sky, everywhere. It was beautiful. And when it was over, there was finally, forever, peace on Earth. The end.